So um, welcome back. I hope all of you had a good break. And so the next presentation is on refactoring of scientific software. Um, and uh, this was this is basically based on uh, largely the experience that I have had in refactoring or going through two major uh, code revisions for the code that I've been associated for the long, longest time. And that is the flash code, which is a multi-physics, multi-domain code. But also in the presentation, I have included a uh, walkthrough of uh, one of the two hands-on exercises we have for this module. And the idea is that uh, as I've walked it through, the, the simpler of the two refactoring exercises we will, I will walk through and you can do it on your own to get your hands dirty with it. And then you can do the more ambitious refactoring exercise. Uh, so let me first start by defining refactoring. So refactoring is uh, not like writing a code from scratch because now you are you have a code that works. What you're doing is you are going through a very disciplined exercise of restructuring the code where you change the internal structure, but you do not change its behavior, which means that you still expect the code to run in the same or, or the code to produce the same results that it did before you did the refactoring, but that um, you have done, um, the, you have modified the internal structure of the code. So you, you start with several advantages. One of them is that you do have a working code. Um, you know and understand the behavior of the code and therefore you can, you can have the baselines that you can build in order to have comparison. Uh, ideally speaking, you can also have um, tests that, can, that you can just go ahead and use without having to worry about developing new tests. Um, the, there are many reasons why people may want to refactor their codes. Uh, many a times um, the exercise is undertaken um, when the code is has been written without a prop, proper modularity in mind and therefore uh, it gets to a point where it becomes unsustainable and people may want to increase the modularity to increase sustain, sustainability of the code. Um, Another very frequent reason why people undergo the process of refactoring is that they've had this code which was internally used and therefore people all who were using it all understood it and knew what to do with it and customize it for their use, but they now want to release it to the outside users who cannot be expected to have the same degree of intimate knowledge with the code and therefore they want the code for to be easier to use and understand for outside users. Um, in the area where I work, which is in the leadership class high performance computing, uh, usually the refactoring happens when one is porting to new platforms. And both the times, uh, well, the, the first major refactoring of Flash was motivated by modularity enhancement because the code, um, the time for a new developer to come and start working on the code used to be very um, long because um, the components of the code that it depended upon were sort of scattered all over the code and tracking down the path of dependencies was kind of hard. But the new modification, uh, the new refactoring on which most of this presentation is based is happening because uh, we have changed the, in the last few years, the parallel programming, uh, the parallel model that we've been programming to has changed from largely distributed memory parallel computing to hierarchical parallel computing with the heterogeneous nodes and therefore the code needed to undergo um, refactoring for performance portability. And sometimes the code undergoes refactoring to expand capabilities, which means that you may need to increase the structural flexibility in the code in order to be able to add new capabilities more re readily. So uh, again, we start out by looking at the running example um, that we've been using of the heat equation. Um, in the repository that we've been pointing you to, there are two versions of the code. 
One is a single file with a monolithic code, and that's the kind of code that is typically what would happen when a um, when, when one you are trying to solve a very simple problem quick and dirty, and you would write the code, and then it would and it has gone around accreting various capabilities, and now you want to make it available to others, and you want to have it be more sustainable, more uh, usable, reusable. The second version of the code that exists there is the modularized, reusable, and maintainable code. So if, for example, we had only the first version, then we would be refactoring to get to the second version. And in the second more ambitious exercise that goes with the hands-on in this module, that is what um, you can do and get your hands dirty with the process of refactoring with the end goal already there for you to show what you might want to be um, getting at. So before you embark on the process of refactoring, there are a few things that are important to know. Because refactoring is a non-trivial exercise, uh, you should know ahead of time, why is it that you're refactoring? Because uh, mission creep is one of the worst things that can happen when you're refactoring. Um, and so the two things that you need to know for every aspect of it, is it really necessary for you to refactor the code? And also have a very clear picture in your mind as to where you want the code to get to uh, after refactoring. So in the heat example version one, for instance, we know that it is necessary for many, many reasons. One of them is that it is a monolithic code and therefore there is no reusability in uh, any part of the code. So if we wanted to devise testing for this code, uh, the device, uh, the testing would be very hard. Unit testing is nearly impossible, uh, but even other kinds of testing that you want to um, add into that code is hard to do because um, um, you cannot simplify testing. It is, um, you have to deal with a relatively simple code like the heat example as though it was a complex code and therefore go through very complex reasoning in order to uh, ensure that you have appropriate coverage for it. And then there is very limited extensibility um, into the code. So that's the first part, is it necessary? Yes, it is necessary because we have a, a badly structured code and we want to have a more maintainable code. Where do we want to be after refactoring? We want to be closer to the second version, which is more modular, maintainable and extensible. Um, before you start on refactoring, there are a few more things that you should know. One of them is the scope of refactoring, which means how deeply do you want to get into the code and how much of the code do you want to touch when you're doing this refactoring and how much of the code is going to be affected by the refactoring that you're going to be doing. So in the heat example, uh, the refactoring that we are talking about, we are not taking into, we, we do not have any capability extension considerations here um, in the example of going from the monolithic code to the modular code. So, uh, and we don't have any performance consideration that we are um, concerned about. All that we want is a cleaner and more maintainable code. So that answers the questions of how deep a change do we want and how much of the code will be affected. And the change that we want to do, we don't really want to change in this refactoring process, the actual integration um, methods that are implemented, that is the numerics. All we want to do is we want to uh, have well-defined interfaces and um, break up the code into smaller components that become um, somewhat encapsulated components and therefore easy to maintain. So to convert the monolithic code, the steps that we would be taking is separate out the utilities and genera generalize interfaces. Uh, all the global definitions that every part of the code assumes uh, go into a header file. Now that in and of itself is a somewhat questionable practice in general. But one of the rules of thumb in doing refactoring is you really want to be making small changes at a time. So ideally uh, for well-encapsulated codes, you are encouraged to 
minimize the number of global definitions that you're using, but at the very least, if you put them in the header file, then you will not have code replication and that every component can just include that header file. Uh, next thing that you want to do is create a general build function because the monolithic code can just be done with the command line uh, compilation command and you don't need to have a make file, but if you want to break it up into smaller components that each one of them then generates its own object file that then you want to link into an executable, then you want to have a build function in place. Uh, and what you don't, in this particular um, exercise, we are very clear from the beginning that we do not want any new code or intrusive changes into the numerical part, parts of the code. The other considerations before you start, one, you should know your cost estimates. And this is a notoriously difficult thing to do. People go wrong very often in terms of their cost estimates. Uh, and people always, almost always, underestimate the amount of work that it is going to take. Uh, before you get started with refactoring, make sure that you have a very robust verification regime in place. Uh, because that is going to be the lifeline for uh, speeding up the work. So with any change you want to make, first of all, you want to make incremental changes as much as possible. And with any change you want, you want to continue to verify that you haven't changed the functionality of the code through the process of refactoring. And so in order to have a robust verification regime, the thing what you, that you need to do is check for coverage provided by the existing tests. Make sure that you um, every aspect of the code can be exercised through testing that you are going to be touching during the process of refactoring. If there are any gaps, you should develop new text, uh, new tests. You should also make sure that the tests exist at different granularities. Um, because you want to be able to check interoperability among the components that you're touching during the process of refactoring as you're going through it. Uh, there should definitely be demanding integration and system level tests. What I mean by demanding um, integration and system level tests is the kind of tests that are designed to uh, expose defects very readily because it's very easy to write tests where you, you convince yourself that it is testing for interoperability, but if you haven't given enough thought to the various ways in which this interoperability can be exercised, you can miss corner cases and this will come back to bite you later. And so it's very important to take into account the kind of functionalities that you absolutely want to preserve in the process of refactoring and make sure that you have tests that exercise that as you're going through the process. Uh, know your bounds which is um, as soon as you touch a code and it is a floating point code and we've hopped upon this point uh, many times uh, during the course of this tutorial is that as soon as you change the order of execution, you no longer have uh, bitwise reproducible answers. And so there is going to be some behavior change to be expected. So you have to know what is the acceptable behavior change before you get start, before you start with the refactoring process, uh, convince yourself that that is uh, the whatever changes you're going to see be seeing are within the bounds of errors that are um, acceptable for the scientific work that needs to be done from there. And it is a very good idea to sort of have an idea of how you're going to get from here to there in the process of refactoring. Um, another thing that can be often overlooked and is very important to uh, keep in mind is that the testing overheads should absolutely be included into the refactoring cost estimates because they're integral part of the process of refactoring. So uh, here is the first hands-on exercise that I'm going to work through. Um, as refactoring of the running example with the heat equation that we've been working with. And you can uh, follow along the, um, on, uh, in the hands-on exercise, if you like, as I am going through the steps and explaining them to you. Now, I'm not actually going to log into the repository. I'm just going to illustrate the steps uh, 
in the slides as they happen. So the first exercise, as I said, is the, uh, in order to do that, that you will do on your own during the hands-on session or later and um, think about how you want your final product to be and then go through the exercise of refactoring, keeping in mind all of the considerations that, are, that I have outlined in the previous slides. Uh, even though we have provided a solution, that is not a unique solution. So you can definitely come up with solutions that are completely different. And as we said before, if you submit a pull request with your solution, we will look at it and give you feedback. Now, the other is a, an example, um, which is an even simpler piece of work that we are doing. What I'm doing here is I'm taking the clean solution and generalizing it. The reason why I'm doing it, if you look at the code, you will notice that every integrator has its own function and the, unif the interfaces for those functions are not uniform, which means that at the runtime, the, the facility that this is giving you is at runtime, you can pick which of the integrators do you want to use to obtain your solution. Uh, and uh, you can invoke that particular answer, but the flip side is that if you wanted to introduce another integrator, you would have to not only add the function for that integrator, but you would also have to change the infrastructure code uh, where the case statement or the branch that you have in order to uh, select a particular integrator will have to be modified every time you want to add a new integrator. So the uh, trade-off here is that um, you don't have, so you have the ability to select at runtime, but you don't have easy extensibility. So what we want to do is we want to change it so that the update solution interface is generalized enough so that the infrastructure that invokes the integrator doesn't need to change if you add a new integrator into the code. And uh, so this is um, here now, the integrator will be picked at compile time instead of at runtime, but the uh, advantage is that all you have to do is add a new function and modify the make file, and you do not have to touch any of the other parts of the code, and therefore you get more extensibility, okay? So the first step, as I pointed out, is preparing for a refactoring, which means that check coverage. And I'm not doing an exhaustive, uh, uh, so in, in this particular example, I'm only using interoperability between two methods of integration, that is FTCS and Upwind 15. I'm not doing an exhaustive uh, work, which you, uh, which you can. So I, I run the make file, I build my binary and I run, uh, and I build it with the coverage turn, uh, code coverage uh, turned on. So uh, what you have to do here is you have to add this uh, uh, into the make file, the gcov coverage uh, and uh, run the, this minus coverage flag. And that will generate the uh, information that can be utilized for us to understand how much of coverage, how, how much of the code is covered in this particular test. So we build this and we run, uh, with FTCS results, we call the, the so the, this is the baseline we are building, which is called FTCS results. Now, as before, as it was explained to you in one of the earlier testing modules, that uh, when you see a dash, th so this the, what you're seeing here is a snapshot of uh, the output that the coverage tools provide, and uh, so in this, where you see a dash, that is a non-executable line. And the number like 500 here that you see in for line 146 tells you how many times that particular line was called. And it's the sequence of hashes that indicates that a line wasn't exercised. So if we look at this code, we see that update solution FTCS was called 500 times, but then the update solution upwind 15, which is the other function that we are trying to 
work on getting interoperability with was not exercised at all. So we clearly don't have a full code coverage here. So we need to generate a new baseline. Uh, in this case, we, don't, we fortunately don't have to generate a new test. We just have to generate a new baseline uh, for this integration method, which is the update solution upwind 15. So uh, what we do is we run uh, the heat test with algorithm selected as upwind 15 and we, pro we generate the baseline. So now we do, if we look at our code coverage again, this time around update solution FTTCS was not exercised, but update solution upwind 15 was exercised. So now we have, at, at the end of this exercise now, we have made sure that we have baselines for the two functions that we want to uh, have a, a general interface for. And so these, these are the two baselines that we are working with. Now we are ready to proceed with the uh, actual process of refactoring. So the starting code for that we are trying to refactor is basically these two interfaces that are, the, I mean, the, there are all of these other interfaces and what we are trying to do is we are trying to generalize the interface. So we notice that one, that the interfaces are not, by interfaces are not identical for all of the solutions. They are indeed identical for FTCS and upwind 15, but then the Crank Nicholson solution has a different interface. And so if we want it to be applied to all of them, then uh, we have to change this interface. So it has one, one thing that it has is this interface is different. And because there is an extra argument in uh, Crank Nicholson, and then there is an extra step in initialization uh, in the Crank, Crank Nicholson scheme. So we want to uh, make sure that these two things are not there to uh, allow for a uniform implementation. So we generalize the interface, which is a union of all of the um, arguments that are needed by various uh, functions that we are going to invoke. And this becomes the general interface. Uh, we modify the make file. So now, uh, depending on which function we want to include, we uh, specify the source and instead of, and which are, so depending on, as I said before, depending on which of these integrators we want to use, we will specify the executable we want built. And finally, for the function that is extra in FTCS, uh, um, that is extra in uh, Crank Nichols and initialization, we add null implementations for those in FTCS and upwind. So this is what now the new solution looks like, is that we have initialized Crank Nicholson. Um, this is the null interface that we've added as uh, a, a something that is available to the code. And then the update solution has become a general interface now, which we notice that it doesn't have any extension uh, as to which particular integrator it is working with. It has uh, the interface defined with this extra argument that comes from Crank Nicholson. And uh, this is a, a snippet of its integration. So now what we do is we make heat one, we run heat. Uh, we, now we are producing the same ex executable uh, and we, so uh, without specifying the argument as to which of the integrators we want to use because that is now selected at um, compile time. And so then we run FTCS, uh, I mean, run heat one with the uh, um, FTCS, and then we make heat two, we run that with the um, upwind results, and then verify each one of those against baseline. And when we have the results verified against baseline, now we know that we have completed the refactoring process. Um, I will take a brief pause here and see if there are any questions before I go on to an example of a more complex real, real world problem of refactoring. Uh, David, are there any questions in chat? I don't see any questions in chat so far. Um, as a reminder, the example that you're going through is is inside of this um, hello numerical world repository that's available on um, through the the links that we've presented uh, absolutely 
And this, um, this particular work that I've uh, gone through step by step is also available to do in the repository as your first exercise in uh, hands on uh, in refactoring, you can bypass that and go on to the other exercise if you want to. But the idea is that if you want to become familiar with the process, then you already have been explained this in great detail and um, uh, it that should make things easier for you a little bit. Okay, so now I will uh, move into doing the real world example. So this real world example comes from the code that I work with, which is Flash. It is a multi-component, multi-physics code where uh, as I mentioned yesterday, extensibility is built in. And so uh, uh, the reason for this particular refactoring is that we have, I mean, the, the overall reason is big, but I'm focusing on one small part of it, which is changing the underlying adaptive mesh refinement that we use. And the reason is that the uh, native AMR that Flash used to work with, and actually the current release version still continues to work with, is Paramesh, which is an Octree AMR, but it has not been under development for several years. It turns out that uh, as soon as we go into heterogeneous platforms, the fact that Paramesh does not support accelerators becomes a problem. So we either have to refactor Paramesh or we have to switch to another um, adaptive mesh refinement package that does support um, accelerators. So in this instance, because Flash has this ability to be extensible and to be able to change into alternative uh, um, implementations of the same functionality, an easier solution for us is to just replace the AMR package. And so what we want to do is we want to replace Paramesh with AMRx. AMRx is being developed under the Exascale Computing Project. It is uh, mandated to be working on, uh, with, on accelerators and the Exascale platforms that are uh, coming out. So basically what we are trying to do is under this, this section, AMR, where only Paramesh exists, we want to build in an alternative implementation that supports AMRx. Uh, notice that we are still keeping Paramesh around because that's an important part of our ramp on process and the ability to do the changes incrementally and the ability to have, have code coverage in all our testing as we are going through the process of refactoring. So uh, the elements of plan that we make in order to get there from here, which means get here from here are we have to think about design uh, in the sense of what if any part of this grid API um, needs to change or what if any part of any of this structure needs to change uh, or what if any part of interfaces published by AMRx need to change in order for this um, goal to be accomplished. Uh, second of all, the, the second part of design process is not just the software itself, but also the process. What process are we going to follow during the refactoring phase so that uh, we don't, um, so that we end up with a robust and a robust code at the end of it without having regressed in terms of the functionalities and the flexibilities it offers. So part of that is how are we going to do the on-ramping? On, by on-ramping, one means that you make changes a little bit at a time, that you don't, do, uh, you don't try to go in one step from here to here because that would be a recipe for disaster, which means that you have to think about the intermediate steps um, and places where you want to get to throughout this process. And uh, finally, how, what, what is the way by which one we, we can realize our goal? So uh, the, we applied the considerations. We did some analysis um, and for Flash, there is a long history of development even uh, which was available through the version control SVN which had been in use in Flash since 2003. So we did some analysis of SVN check-ins, et cetera, et cetera. And the uh, knowledge of 
the code and the developer population uh, and made an estimate. So we, we, we were not making this estimate in vacuum. We were making this estimate based upon some concrete information we had about the complexity of the code and the kind of effort it had taken to do the first round of refactoring in Flash. So we did the cost estimation from there, which was, which was the expected developer time. The second thing that we considered uh, very deeply was the extent of disruption in production schedules, because uh, it's not as though when we are doing refactoring the science calculations with Flash stop. And in fact, because Flash has a wide user base outside of, uh, I mean, uh, that international wide, internationally wide user base, the, there is the dual role that the developers have to play is in terms of supporting the existing users as well as going through the process of refactoring and making sure that the end product then ends up being not very disruptive to the users um, who may be developing their own custom physics capabilities into the code. So that's another consideration that has to be kept in mind is that the APIs that are exposed to the physics units are not changed in this process of refactoring, or if they are, if they absolutely need to change, that the change remains minimal. Um, and in order to do this, it is important to get a buy-in from the stakeholders, and um, because uh, the process will not go smoothly. So, uh, stakeholders play two important roles. Uh, one of them is that. Uh, once they agree to um, development time and the disruptions that are going to occur in their development and in their production schedules, they're much more likely to co cooperate with the process of refactoring. And the second one is, uh, it is almost uh, a given that in a complex code, the testing coverage is not very comprehensive. Um, in terms of, because what you're doing is when you're doing your regular testing and the code is in the maintenance mode, you can make certain assumptions about certain parts of the code that don't need to be exercised on a regular basis. And it is possible that the tests that exercise those portions in certain ways have disappeared because there was uh, the, there, there had been no disruption in the code. And, um, so this is a typical situation of the kind that you face with legacy codes is that all of a sudden you're touching a part of the code that hadn't been uh, that had been taken for granted for a while but now you need to make sure that when you touch it when you change it that it do doesn't break and that therefore you need actually a broader test coverage when you're starting to do the refactoring than you need to do when you when you when your code is basically in a maintenance and use mode so the stakeholders, as in users and science domain users in particular, are extremely important in ensuring that you have adequate test coverage, that you understand the error bars, and you understand the kind of behavioral change that is going to be acceptable in the code. So our initial estimate for doing this particular bit of uh, uh, modification bringing in MRX was about six to 12 months. Uh, and we thought we knew what we were doing. In the end, it turned out to be closer to 12 months than six months. So we went totally out of whack, but we still were being overly optimistic if, um, in thinking that we may actually be able to do this in six months. Um, you don't need to pay attention to this particular figure now because now I'm going to go through each of these steps individually. So we started with Flash version 4.4, and these were these were our steps in the process. Um, we generated so we had to have one particular example problem that we could exercise both the codes with over and over again, and our basic hydrodynamic solver is very complicated, and it has many moving parts. So what we did was because we are touching only the infrastructure we didn't need the full functionality of that very complex hydrodynamic solver. So we created a very simple hydrodynamic solver, which is the, uh, of the kind that you might have to be, uh, that you might be asked to develop in an introductory uh, 
computational fluid dynamics class, for example. So we implemented that, uh, made it compatible with the, the larger uh, hydrodynamics code. So the, the actual hydro code that sits in Flash was um, the algorithm, uh, algorithm development and implementation was the work of a scientist who took roughly a year to bring it to the level of maturity. The simple hydro took about a week's time. What, we, what it did was uh, it basically made sure that the interfaces and the data structures were compatible with the, uh, um, the more complex hydro solver or the real hydro solver that we would need to have working in the code. Again, we are relying upon the ability of Flash to switch between alternative implementations seamlessly. From MRX, we did requirements gathering in terms of uh, what should the physics iterators look like? Uh, because MR gives, it, it, it's, so Paramesh exposes the uh, global identity of each one of its spatial components, which we call blocks, to the physics, MRX doesn't. And so MRX relies upon iterators to make those very same entities available to the physics units. So, the first step in the process that we realized was to change our way of uh, querying Paramesh for the blocks and make it go through an iterator process uh, and make it uh, and build an, an iterator interface for it. So in the simple hydro then, the first change that happened was that we replaced the iterator iterators from explicit uh, block identification to obtaining a block through iterators. So that was step one. What this, what this did was is, is to allow us to make the interfaces um, for the mesh implementation itself to be uniform. So what here, we, as you see, we put iterators on top of simple hydro and we put, um, so the unit that manages the discrete, discretized mesh is called grid. And so what we did was we uh, enhanced grid API a little bit and provided a new alternative implementation for that interface, which now sat over and above the AMRX mesh. So that when Simple Hydro came in and it utilized this new API of the grid unit, it couldn't tell under the hood whether it was interacting with AMRX or with Paramesh. Uh, and initially, initially we did, so it is also possible to turn off all of the adaptive mesh functionality in the code. So initially we did this by turning off the adaptive mesh capabilities and just getting the grid API to work with a uniformly discretized mesh on, param uh, on both the paramesh side and the AMRX side. Uh, next thing, is to exercise the functionality that needs to work for the AMR to function properly. So uh, in AMR, the important thing to know is that the, the um, deltas, the spatial uh, distances between two points vary depending on which level of refinement you are at. Um, so when you are, when you have a spatial uh, component that is at a coarser resolution than its adjacent finer resolution space, you need to do certain um, actions in order to reconcile the quantities at the fine coarse boundaries. And these are very important because otherwise you will violate the conservation laws. And so all of the actions that need to happen at the fine coarse boundary were the ones that were exercised next and an appropriate and the hydro driver still uh, was made to work with, so the simple hydro was not doing any of these functionalities of flux correction at all. So now what we, we have done in this step is to switch over to the unsplit hydro uh, with the iterator infrastructure that we built for the hydrodynamics unit and started to first exercise it without, the, so the, the, there are two steps involved here. One is replacement of simple hydro with unsplit hydro, still work with uniform grid, and exercise and, com uh, and convince ourselves that in the uniform grid mode, unsplit hydro cannot tell the difference between paramesh and AMRX. 
And the next step then we made sure that the MR related functionalities that uh, needed to be exercised by the unsplit hydro were also working out fine. And uh, the top level interaction was working out fine. So at the end of this now, we had a fully functional grid API, which accounted for all of the functionality that one needed to um, have from both AMRX and Paramesh. And this is now working with our full uh, complexity of our hydrodynamic solver. So what we have is a, uh, for AMRX, we have a new grid unit implementation. And for unsplit IDO, we, we have the things from old flash. And now we have uh, gone through the process of uh, refactoring and we have a code where both the, we can, we can switch at will between Paramesh and um, MRX. Now we did a lot of things in between uh, as a part of testing regime that I don't have uh, time to go into details, but they're reported in a paper that we wrote because we, we did many um, uh, permutations and combinations where we would have Paramesh create a mesh and make AMRX believe as though it created the mesh by uh, to reconcile the meta information that the two meshes were using and so on and so forth. And um, I'll be happy to talk to people also about it at length. But with this, we had a full refactoring done. So to summarize and the takeaways from this module is that if you want to have good outcome from refactoring, it is important to know why you want to refactor. Uh, have a very clear idea of, uh, is it necessary? Do you really need to do it? And how much change do you want? Uh, you want to know the cost, you need to do your cost benefit uh, trade-off analysis right up front to uh, prevent mission creep from happening. And also to have people that are going to be affected by your refactoring to be on board. You need to do a plan. You need to plan all of the intermediate steps and the number of intermediate steps depends upon the complexity of the task that you're undertaking. Have a very strong testing and verification regime built in before you do the first bit of refactoring and get a buy-in from the stakeholders. Uh, all of those are critical things in order to have uh, success from refactoring. And that's all I had.